Okay, we're set. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to the University of Minnesota School of Architecture Spring 2022 Lecture Series. We're delighted to present this series of talks this semester and glad that you have joined in person. And those of you who are online, thank you for joining. The talks this term are organized around practices that creatively take on what already exists, validating, activating, and recomposing social and material fabrics. In doing so, we hope to bring together critical voices that directly engage with environmental change and work to advance spatial justice. I'm thrilled to welcome um, our first speaker in the series, Julie Torres Moskowitz, the principal of FET Nature Architecture. Julie earned a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Arts in African Studies and French from the University of Michigan. As a Passive House Certified Consultant, Julie is the author of the book, The Greenest Home, Super Insulated and Passive House Design, published by Princeton Architectural Press in 2013. She was also the architect of New York City's first certified passive house building, an 1899 row house retrofit in 2012, an accomplishment which informs her public speaking and teaching, including courses at Syracuse University School of Architecture. FET Nature Architecture, also known as FNA, and based in Brooklyn, New York, is a, in their words, vital collaborative firm whose process is founded in research and investigation of new ways to inhabit the urban fabric. The studio's work is informed by their commitments to decarbonization, climate adaptation, and community and social justice. FNA Studios work spans an inspiring array of engagements from passive house retrofitting of both residential and commercial structures, adaptive reuse and future proofing buildings against flood risk to the redesign of public commercial spaces for street vendors, the post pandemic transformation of city streets and healthy workplaces. FNA is also involved in community advocacy with positions on the boards of the Street Vendor Project and the New York City Loft Law Board. As a studio which considers the aesthetic, social, legal, technical, and of course, environmental dimensions of working with existing fabrics, FNA is an inspiring example for contemporary practice. Julie, thank you so much for joining. Um, we look forward to your talk and from here, I'll pass it to you. Hello, thank you, Gabrielle, for the nice introduction. Uh, so I am from FET Nature Architecture, an architecture office that I founded in Brooklyn in 2015. I appreciate the chance to speak here with the uh, lecture series that you have at University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, particularly because of the, the way the topic is framed. So spatial practitioners incorporating existing fabrics and their accompanying histories and contemporary potentials into reframed and altered configurations. I was inspired by that to reflect on my own practice. I've been in New York City for the last uh, 21 years since grad school. And uh, the topic, the title of my lecture is called Adaptive Futures. So Gabrielle just, just read our mission. Uh, because we're gonna have a conversation afterwards, I wanted to challenge the students, if you're thinking of having your own architecture firm, to think of what your mission is and the type of work you'd wanna work on in your practice. So um, I'm gonna just zoom through here because you already read out loud my uh, mission statement, but it's something that I worked on for years. Uh, actually, when I started, didn't have a mission, I just needed work. And um, as I moved along through my career, trying to prioritize where I, where I could align my passions in the, for environmental justice and dealing with climate change with architecture. 
So the first thing I wanted to recommend for students, and even if there's any practitioners listening to me, is to make an activism folder on your server. I, I made one in 2016. Um, I started my firm in 2015, but thought of this idea, I just need a 000 activism folder at the top of my server. And that uh, sets me up for realizing how important it is to be part of the community and participate. So the beginning of my talk, I wanted to focus on uh, the top right corner where it says thermal imagery as political expression, because I see thermal imagery as, uh, as political in, in the way that I'm using it. And it wasn't, I wasn't the first, uh, or my, let's see which came first. I saw this image here on the screen of my project, but it was taken by uh, a fellow colleague in the passive house world named Sam McAfee. So he took this picture of our tight house project, the first certified passive house in, in um, New York City. And it's now 10 years ago, that was in 2012 that we were certified and so we're 20, 22 now. And he took this picture actually because two doors down on the right, he was doing a retrofit of a building towards Passive House and he wanted to be able to maybe have a series of photos of this urban row house strip where slowly the houses start to look like the blue house and uh, don't have leaking out their windows and doors. Um, generally it's fossil fuel that you're seeing that's leaking because many of the homes are heated with a furnace or boiler and so and radiators. So you're, you're literally warming your building and then it's going right out the windows and doors. So the passive house project in blue shows that those triple glazed passive house windows and doors and the thorough job of insulation and air tightness are doing a pretty good job keeping, um, keeping the electric heat in and um, not being wasteful. So this image, when I saw it, I had um, just finished a book that was 30,000 words. And I, I really thought this image had more power than all the words of my book. I don't want to downplay the importance of books because I'm, I was happy I wrote it. It was 18 case studies on passive house projects. And, and because I was doing a project at the same time, I was really engaged in speaking to contractors, owners, early adopters, uh, engineers working in this mode in uh, the early 2000s. I also became very involved after my project finished with uh, talking to government agencies and, and discussing Passive House with various agencies across New York City. New York City has a lot of forward progressive um, environmental policies as it heads towards like a decarbonized city and, and um, in our future. So a couple of those, that I feel like either I taught classes to other engineers or taught in at Syracuse where I teach in the NYC program, or just from advocating and talking at conferences, I feel part of those public policies. Um, I don't know if I had a little part in it, but to show that um, we can do this. Like I did this project as a new firm starting out and we were able to, to make this home uh, Passive House certified, actually at the level of a new construction versus the slightly lesser um, relaxed um, retrofit certification. So all the way up to like a new new construction, but it was from 1899. So the I just for context for for you from Minneapolis, the New York City has um, Local Law 31 which is for public buildings, they have to be 50% better energy performers than energy code. And then we also more recently have local law 97, which um, means that our buildings, they're pushing private owners over 25,000 square foot buildings have to also um, 
actively work towards making their building greener or they'll face um, carbon taxes, carbon penalties at incremental stages starting in 2024. I um, learned about these policies and then taught um, classes at the AIA in New York about them. So uh, another thing that I've done is I partnered with a Belgian architect for about five years. We, I met him um, when I won the, the, the Passive House project that we were talking about, won an international design award in 2014 and I had a scholarship to go to Europe. I went to Belgium where in Brussels, it's mandatory to do Passive House on any building, whether it's landmarked, new construction, uh, any retrofitting. And so I saw that they had all types of building, whatever you walked into was, was Passive House. So it was very easy to understand and realize that we should be moving in that direction. So I partnered with a Belgian architect and um, while we're still friends, we're no longer partners, but what I, learned from that is we spoke to many more government agencies and, and developers and, you know, to kind of educate the um, construction industry. And I think it has a payoff. So I think architects need to be doing this um, in your career and thinking about it. So back to thermal imagery as political expression. I, at Syracuse, um, the students come to New York City for a semester and usually on their way to Florence or, or Europe for the second semester. So a good way to explore the city, I think, is with the FLIR attachment camera that goes onto your iPhone. And here's an example of student study where they looked at LED signage in Times Square. This was prior to COVID. This is from 2018. And they were showing how they researched and showed how wasteful these signs were. Uh, using a lot of energy. Two years later, I saw Extinction um, Rebellion did a, um, did for Earth Day, they did this event where they show that Times Square actually consumes as much energy as the entire country of Turks Caicos or at peak that it consumes enough energy to power 161,000 homes. So, in that sense that my students a couple of years ago discovering this, these powerful images with um, thermal imagery, I think is um, along with these memes from Extinction Rebellion just shows you our priorities and how, um, how we're really working our, our way into trouble with the planet. And so what I like about thermal imagery is that it just, it, it's showing you the invisible, right? And um, it speaks because you can understand what the image is saying. Here's um, another area of my activism, which has been with Street Vendor Project. So this is just um, a simple image I took the other month. Um, it's a street vendor sitting in the middle of the billboards of Times Square. And um, at the bottom, I have a quote, because we've had a lot of advocacy work for these, what essentially is emergency workers um, through COVID, street vendors providing food. Um, this was in 2016, a quote from the deputy health commissioner of our former mayor de Blasio. She says, meat grilling is a significant source of air pollution in the city. One additional vendor grilling meat emits an amount of particle pollution in one day, equivalent to what a diesel truck emits driving 3,500 miles. I, I just put the little haunt huh in the corner because I'm, I hear this stuff as I become politically involved where lobbyists, in this case, it's lobbyists from hotels, restaurants, and grocery stores say this there, there might be a grain of truth in what they're saying. Sure, we all have to work to improve. Street vendors need to improve um, their generators and their char broilers, but certainly that little street vendor amongst surrounded by billboards that are uh, using more power than countries is not the problem. And, it, and they are not, like one of them is not equal to driving you know, all the way to California with a diesel truck. So I just think that there's, um, we have to be careful with politicians. And one way I thought 
to talk about this could be through thermal imagery. So here's other students that were looking at restaurants, hotels, and um, grocery stores. This is papaya dog, like a classic 24 seven restaurant. And the students were taking pictures just prior to COVID. And um, you can see that the facade, I mean, it's well trafficked, but that the facade itself is as is true of most of our ground floor retail spaces is very leaky at the storefront. And here's McDonald's um, all lit up in the thermal image. I think recently McDonald's has started to go net zero with one site, I think in Chicago, um, but a little late for that McDonald's. Um, so anyway, this was an interesting study that students did to um, see how buildings are performing. And actually this, this team had a thesis like would chain stores, corporate locations like McDonald's be more energy efficient than like small papaya dog or smaller mom and pop stores, which did not appear to be true. Meaning that the corporate firm that had more money still was not um, using that money to make a hyper efficient building. Um, this image, so I'm still on the topic of thermal imagery as political expression, but this is just some images I wanted to show you of the work I do a street vendor project. On the right is a team at, from Pratt, where I, I sometimes teach at Pratt, and we had a Pratt Center um, Taconic Fellowship. So those are uh, five students I worked with on um, starting up on a project that's very active now. In fact, I have a design lab on Wednesday and Thursday of this week for this topic. But we there we were at a facility where they're making street carts. And just like I said, the lobbyists are saying street vendors are polluting. Well, street vendors have an environmental justice grant and they're trying to be greener. Um, I hope that buildings will follow suit. Um, so street vendors are doing this. And on the, the left is a from a protest in Times Square. And then in the upper middle is Kile and I teaching a webinar prior to COVID where there were studies that women vendors of all vendors, women vendors have it the hardest um, because they are unable to get permits to legally sell. They, the larger carts like what's manufactured in the top right are like two tons and cost $40,000. And they don't, they are, they're, many of them are, are uh, single mothers working in the boroughs selling like mangoes, cucumbers, and uh, they need lighter carts to work. And they're also targeted by the police for ticketing because the police know that women can't have a permit. There haven't been new permits issued since 1983 and there's a underground market for this. Last January, we, um, we all advocated and a new bill passed. So there's 400 new permits um, every month starting this year, but, it, but the vendors haven't seen a benefit yet. It takes that long for a new local law to roll out. This is just speaking to uh, a new Equinox gym hotel in Hudson Yards that could have been built to net zero or passive house standard, but wasn't um, beautiful facade, but um, critiquing the performance of it. So the students were looking at that. And I say that as a backdrop to a street vendor because there's been a lot of tension between Hudson Yards, this special new district where street vendors have been for years and, and all the new construction there. This just also speaks to, I think this is an IMPA designed building in Kipps Bay and in um, Midtown on the east side. And uh, interesting like waffle iron grid facade, but it's very leaky. It needs a retrofit for, for its windows. And so the students were studying that. Um, this is sort of a backdrop to the same topic of being political. I myself live in a rental you can maybe see behind me. It's a, I have my office, it's a live workspace in a factory that was converted to housing illegally um, and is on the loft law track. 
So here's, uh, here's some thermal images of my bedroom actually from a couple of weeks ago. And you can see that, um, well, maybe you can see on the left, there's a cutout where there was a former door and what you're looking at the linear line is a metal stud and there's no insulation in that wall. So it's like the thermal camera saying it's 51 degrees in my bedroom and um, <laughs> the floor is freezing too. So my feet are in the middle image and then um, you can see the temperatures like 50, 49. Uh, degrees approximately. And then even when I move, you can see the heat of my feet on the floor in the thermal image. And then on the right is the little heater that we have to plug in, the little electric heater. So I, this is just something I'm being personal here, but sharing that I do thoroughly insulated and airtight passive house projects, but I live in a rental and um, I have to use an electric heater to heat my bedroom. So um, I understand that in order for us to get anywhere in the city, we really have to roll this out for renters. And these are just some headlines. Recently, there was a terrible tragedy in the Bronx where 17 people died um, due to an electric heater because a lot of these um, larger rental apartment buildings um, may not provide enough heat as I just showed you my example. And um, when, when people are running electric heaters, there's um, plug-in heaters, there's more risk of fire. And um, that's what happened, I think it was three weeks ago in the Bronx. And then below on the left is an Oakland fire that was in a loft building where th I think 36, yeah, 36 people lost their lives. Young people, there was a fire and um, so another area of advocacy that I've done is um, I'm no longer on the Loft Law board, but I was on it for three years. And that started from research that I did at the Institute for Public Architecture on live work for the workforce, where um, you can see, if you can see the map on the left, there's dots where all the loft buildings are. Um, this is not all the rental buildings in New York, New York's majority renter buildings, but these are, buildings that were warehouses or manufacturing that were converted at some point to uh, residential. And that loft law provides a track to have landlords and tenants work together to legalize their building and make it safe. In this proposal here, I, we were proposing micro hubs for power on top of these buildings. Many of the loft law buildings from the 2010 law or the 2019 law that passed are larger buildings, so they have much larger roof area. So we were just uh, hypothesizing on if we added um, alternative energy to their roofs. And this is the final thermal imagery as political uh, expression I wanted to share. This map, I, we actually mapped when we had the Live Work Fellowship, and it's showing the industrial business zones of New York City in red and yellow stripes. And then it might be hard to see for you in person, but there's little dots uh, that represent where the loft buildings were. Now we mapped this because there was similar to lobbyists, what I was saying with street vendors, there were a lot of lobbyists against loft tenants like myself because they said the loft tenants were killing in manufacturing in New York City. But we know that that's, uh, a problem that all of the United States spaces when um, industry was moved abroad um, around the world. And so it's not due to loft tenant renters um, that, that the industry zones are killed. It is true that we don't wanna have people moving into factories and, and um, if there's an active uh, manufacturing business there, we wanna keep manufacturing alive and, and going. So this map was created for that loft law research, but it also came up as a topic that um, I had my students look at industrial business zones. I attended an urban design forum and had a speaker come to talk to my students who's with Sustainable Bronx. I, it, they're um, a group that provides green jobs and he was, he was stating out loud, and I spoke to him afterwards, that 
that industrial business zones should be exemplary in green 21st century design with environmental justice and cutting edge green technology instead of archaic older polluting buildings and systems. And I, that spoke to me. I think that's very true. When you look at these areas of the industrial zone, they're right near housing too, and or sometimes mixed in the same zone. And they're very inefficient buildings. So this is, I haven't done much with this, but I do think there's a lot here to explore in our industrial business zones. Um, so with that, I wanted to go into our projects, but I thought that that was a good way to think about how to frame your political action with um, architecture and space. So thermal imagery is one way I've just learned um, through over time that um, is a good way to start discussing things and sort of pushing back against lobbyists that are creating a narrative that's untrue. So this is, as I mentioned, this is 10 years ago, the tight house, the first certified passive house. And this is what you get. And I really appreciate the lecture series being about and recognizing that architects don't really get as much credit for retrofitting. But if you look at Architecture 2030, Ed Mizria's challenge, most of our buildings are already built. So in order to reach the challenge and help stop the you know, increase in temperature for the planet, we have to retrofit these buildings. So all the projects I'm gonna show you right now, I just wanna be clear that we took out gas, there's no longer fossil fuel and they're electrified. The idea being that, that the grid will continually improve and I know that former Governor Cuomo was saying that 2040, our electric grid system would be carbon neutral. Biden, when he started as president, said 2035. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to land, but the idea is like if you electrify the buildings, that uh, the grid can be improved and then, and then we're, we can reach some of our climate goals. So these buildings also um, all have alternative energy or a green roof on the roof. So once you make a building retrofit and it's a continuous insulation and airtight, it then makes sense to add alternative energy on site. So instead of a waste uh, leaky existing building where you put solar on top, now you've got a building that's uh, you know, 21st century, thoroughly insulated and ready to go. And so I think that makes a lot more sense than to, you get more bang for your buck with alternative energy. This picture is just taken during construction by a photographer friend of mine, Will Mabain. And it, we're, we're standing in the cellar of the Tight House project. And you can see there's a whole new back facade. So poured concrete and uh, CMU above with, um, you can see, air tightness, um, high tech like membrane in orange coming through and there will be tape around the triple glazed windows. You can also see the existing in the forefront, like at the lower level, the existing stone um, granite foundation work. That's very much rocks on top of each other with gaps of sand in between, making that airtight is a challenge and, and the white that you're seeing on the wall is thorough seal, like a product for making um, the space airtight masonry. Here's a picture of me. I'm always climbing up weird ladders. This job in particular um, had a lot of sketchy ladders going on, but you can see the existing shell is on either side of me on the left and right with the pink and white. And it's going through various stages of making the it airtight and the new joists in the pockets um, safer um, fire rating, but also airtight, and, which is a big challenge. And then <laughs> you see at the back facade, a new fa facade of CMU. And here's further construction. We did a lot of insulation on the outside at the rear facade. It's um, mineral wool uh, rain screen and um, a new, I forget the name of the, 
the smart membrane on the back facade, but uh, maybe you recognize the orange color and with um, special high performance tape. And on the right is the front of the building that's actually foam. Um, I'll show you a couple of construction shots. It's foam with at the top, the cornice is now fiberglass instead of wood, but you can't really tell from the street. And the owner's priority was to make things low maintenance and sustainable. Here's, um, I wanted to show you a few um, drawings that are special to retrofitting. I've never seen this kind of drawing, like we came up with it in-house. Uh, maybe it exists, but it's never really featured anywhere. So this is our understanding of like what is existing in the house and what's new, because we're adding a vertical addition and a new back facade. Uh, we also had other client needs like this kind of funny triangulated shape here is where um, the, the wife wanted to see brick like a loft, but we knew the brick wouldn't be air tight. So we, we had to add a layer of brick, old br recycled brick from the site back in that zone to show it. And we made it airtight behind the brick. Um, there's also a haunch that happens at different levels, depending which building where the foundation wall is thicker and then it the brick can drop off a wife and you have to air seal that that seam. Number 10 is where we had um, like a shaft of certain plumbing or air supply that we needed. And we had less space for insulation, which was okay because, well, at the in the middle zone, it was a party wall. We're sharing a wall with a neighbor. But as you go up to the top floor, you're then exposed again. So to make sure we met passive house standards, we, we had to think about this in advance and did this drawing. Here's a couple more shots of the construction and, and what passive house is or makes architects do is to think ahead a bit and the sequencing of construction is different than it would be on other projects. So this is a Solitex membrane in black, if you can see my hand, my mouse, um, that, that is between the new CMU vertical extension and the, and the framed out roof. We had to get that special membrane in at the right time. It, it'd be too late to put it in after the wood framing's up. So it had to be ordered and, and installed and slipped in there as a continuous piece that could be taped down ahead of time. <laughs> at the bottom is a um, EFIS stove facade where you can see the EPS foam at the exterior. There's a drain, miniature like 332nd drainage plane behind, the, um, behind it. And um, you see a triple glazed Shuka window. This is interesting. Um, for me, and it always comes up. Once you make an envelope that's extremely well insulated and airtight, you don't want to have flooding and mold come in, you, which always happens in buildings we're facing, maybe because I think climate change is causing heavier rains. Uh, also though, you can't control your neighbor, you might have an exploded pipe next door. So there's always issues of flooding, whether it's from our sewage system, uh, our hurricanes, um, a neighbor. So wh what do you do about it? Well, you start thinking about it a lot more when, you're, when you've made this well insulated envelope. So here's an example. And actually it's funny, you see a boulder buried in the um, cellar at the ground of this tight house, but we're doing a sump pump with perforated pipes and um, uh, gravel, and then there'll be insulation and this poly mill uh, wrap so that we don't have water wicking up through the concrete slab. And that ends up getting taped all along the edge so it stays airtight too. So these are just some final pictures quickly of, of that project. So on the left is the back facade, on, all new. On the front is actually, <laughs> I must admit, a foam EFIS facade that I worked hard. I, I didn't think I was going to have to do that in architecture school, but I worked hard with these to get the details right with foam um, to match this non-landmarked district um, so that it, it could fit into the neighborhood. And here's some pictures of the interior. It was important for us to bring lots of light in. 
And these passive house windows tilt and turn and open like doors. So there's a lot of fresh air if you wanted in between season, but you also with the ERV have fresh air constantly being filtered and brought, brought to each area and extracted from kitchens and bathrooms. Here's the um, parlor area looking back and the top floor. And here's the, the roof terrace off the top floor. By the way, this is my son who was like, now it's 10 years later, so he's going to college in September. Um, these projects take a long time. Um, and having your kid in the pictures reminds you of how much time passes. And here's the, we had solar thermal on the roof and solar PV on the roof. Oh, sorry. Now, quickly, I'm going to show you another component of my practice, which is um, resiliency. What all of us in New York faced, uh, the superstorm Sandy really knocked us out. There was another one that just, I think, Ida that happened in the fall that was also bad. But this Hurricane Sandy um, caused so much damage, they created a big program called Build It Back. And I was lucky enough to participate. Um, I can talk a little about it, maybe now that our mayor de Blasio is gone, because we were never allowed to talk about this program. There was always such bad news about Hurricane Sandy and the recovery of it that I felt like there was no dialogue in our city about what it meant. But Build It Back um, was, I think there were thousands of homes that were repaired. I could critique it. I think one of the best points of it is that um, it trained aside from helping family individual families it also trained a whole group of architects and engineers and builders to be able to build with resiliency in mind the negative factors i think are spending six hundred thousand dollars on a house to fix it of federal funds um, i don't think that's the right path um, to go six hundred thousand or a million because that seems like we can't do that for every person in this country. Um, so that's my critique that I was never really allowed to express. But here we go with um, the house being on cribbing elevated. And at this point, um, another critique of the program, it was interesting, it was union contractors, I like unions, but there were different subs and I guess they were busy at the back half of the house fell off during cribbing. And so I had to do an addition to replace what the owner had before, a new addition combined with an existing um, elevation lift. So you're looking at cribbing and these are for the helical piles um, that went in to the ground. Here's the continuous concrete. Um, we raised this home a little more than eight feet. And here's just a model uh, that I did showing like the 40 feet of helical piles that um, went down below the, the grade beams and um, the urban context below in the left. On the right, I, I do wanna say that this crew of contractors that were Lero, they were called, they were managing us. And I did a couple of um, Builder Back projects that they, they would kind of poke fun at me for passive house that I was trying to make this passive house. I did think once we were spending that much money for individuals, like we might as well make it resilient and passive house. Um, Cause why build back something less than what you can do? Uh, they were laughing at me, but in this image, which is the ground, the crawl space that they all have, cause you're not allowed to have buildings, uh, habitable space below the floodplain, that was part of the rule. They were experiencing like um, pipes freezing and on other build it back projects that were elevated, pipes freezing and mold from um, the dampness below. And they, they did end up using my like passive house um, details for underneath those elevated um, homes that like floor is basically a, the same as your roof. It's exposed to elements and a lot of moisture can happen at the cellar. So I, that was a good lesson that I had, I learned a lot through 
uh, passive house training and then applied it to this resiliency. And here's the home. I, I didn't take final pictures here, but um, because it was a very difficult process for owners, they spent five years in, in dealing with a moldy house and he had basically an open sewer pit um, since the hurricane and it took years to happen. This finished in 2018. So this is another project quickly that is a, uh, a landmarked row house in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And here the clients didn't like how, how much, how drafty the existing windows were and uncomfortable it was in the winter. So we did a, a full retrofit. Well, not a complete retrofit here. There were other areas like the stairwell and spaces uh, along the party wall that were fine. So we just focused on the facade and did triple glazed windows and um, air tightness at the facade. We also did, um, it worked well because we, these brownstones sometimes have to be resurfaced, which is a big job. This guy on the left is um, repairing a landmarked brownstone and on the right is the various colors. We had to send photos to landmarks to approve color and texture. And um, he's up at the cornice here. You can see that he's got to create the shape. It ended up looking beautiful, but um, they cut it back and, um, and then build it back up. It's like an ancient craft. It ended up looking beautiful in the end. Here's um, the triple glazed window, which because it's landmarks, it looks like it's double hung, but that's just a simulation. The top is fixed and the bottom opens um, is operable. And you can see the new brownstone. So it was good that we resurfaced the brownstone because it we made a better detail for air tightness at those locations where the windows and doors went in. And here's a blower test, door test being done by a, a building science friend of mine. And here's the final brownstone resurfaced. All the brownstone was redone and the windows are uh, triple glazed passive house windows. And that also has, um, here's a image from the interior, new, new passive house doors as well. That was very leaky. And um, here's just a picture from the interior. So still classic traditional architecture and the, the roof um, with solar as well. And then um, here I've got uh, a project that just finished up. I just got these photos in Crown Heights, um, a, a two family row house that we retrofitted. And I wanted to share these quickly. This is the level of extreme retrofitting that we're talking about where a lot of steel and flitch plates are added to fix old joists that are sagging. And in the corner we have um, steel added to like connect the back of the house to, or the front of the house to the party walls. And um, in this case, there's always problems that are crazy that we have to deal with. And in this case, we have these giant um, cracks in the wall and that's a supposed to be a two hour rated wall. If there was a fire like in the neighbor's building, like smoke would definitely come through that. So we had to work out with the neighbor how to fix this properly for fire rating and for air tightness. And um, you might not think about this, but a lot of these buildings have an old boiler flue on the right and a fireplace. And my owner wanted to be off, um, no boiler, no, no um, furnace, no fireplace. So we had to take all these down and carefully figure out like how it interconnects with the neighbor because that's a negotiation with a shared party wall. It's also obviously a fireplace wouldn't be good for air tightness because it's a hole through your house. Um, here is, this is a problem photo. When I saw this, I was kind of freaked out. Um, we don't work with contractors that are specific to passive house. We just work with any contractor and try and work the way they work and have them understand passive house. Here they were going, um, whoever the worker was working so hard to get it airtight, but it was like taking um, so much effort. It really looked scary. We, they had to, they didn't apply them, the fluid applied membrane with enough thickness. So they had to reapply. And this image shows where they were patching holes. Here's just some more photos of construction and the carefulness that we 
put in the giant triple glazed sliding doors and new passive house skylight and detail um, in the existing home. And here we also had a blower door test in the middle to make sure we were hitting targets. And um, that's Kevin taking a smoke pen to see how it's leaking. You can see now the layers of tape, the fluid applied membrane, the mineral wool insulation, and the triple glazed window. Uh, you also see a little bit of spray foam in areas that were hard to get in between like old lintels. And here's the final product. I just um, took these photos last week in neighborhood context. And the back, which I'll re-photograph like when it's nice weather, but um, they have new giant sliding door, triple glazed, and you can see their solar on the roof as well. And this is a two family house. Here's some images from the interior, uh, pretty minimalist design but we always try and bring a lot of natural light and have fun with materials too, uh, but limited palette. Um, kitchen at the back. And so now I'll quickly go through a few more projects. I have about 10 more minutes. Um, these are, this continues my work with um, street vendor projects. I joined their advisory board in 2015 when I worked on a street vendor commissary. I replied to a post from an organization that would match nonprofits with architects. And ever since I've just loved working with street vendors. So I've done a number of idea competitions and collaboration or on our own. And it's, it's a process. There's so many issues with street vending in our city. Here's an image of us at our um, like leadership team and Governor's Island, which is right off the lower part of Manhattan. Um, we have an annual conference. And here, this is a design from our commissary, uh, exemplary commissary that you see in section here, we are planning for a shared kitchen where you store carts, because in New York City, you have to have your cart in a commissary. There's about 106 commissaries, but they're very um, bare bones and really hard for kitchen space you know they might have just six feet of a stainless steel kitchen counter and that's it and bad lighting and it's hard for street vendors to experiment with like foods from their traditional countries possibly or to expand beyond selling pretzels and water because they're you have to cook in a shared kitchen so this was the idea of a training center with um also herb garden on the roof of this converted warehouse in Williamsburg. And it kind of matches from our research, the parameters of um, commissaries. We went with street vendor project to a lot, but tried to make, imagine it as a, a better place where people would enjoy being and could, um, could grow from there, grow their business. And this was right before COVID. We worked with Street Vendor Project. As I mentioned, we did, we presented a webinar, um, Kile, a, a vendor friend of mine and myself on women in particular. So there we came in Jackson Heights, Queens, 74th and Roosevelt. There were empty vendor spaces or empty store spaces inside this very popular transit station. And we there were one, two, three, four, five. There were five spaces that we were gonna be able to take over for two years from the MTA as an experiment with a community run women um, based vendors that when, and we were working with local politicians and teams for that work. Our workshop with the women was actually scheduled for March 13th, 2020, which ended up being exactly when the city shut down from COVID. And obviously that trains experience, like no one was riding the MTA for a while. And I haven't heard about this project again, but I like the concept of it, that you could have a community of women working collaboratively together and they could cover for each other if, um, if needed and be inside an MTA station. Here was advocacy work we did for open streets to make sure that vendors could be side by side with, in this case, it's showing Shake Shack. Um, city council was passing bills, helping 
the street uh, stay open during COVID and also uh, restaurants to be able to move onto the street, but we want to make sure that vendors weren't going to be squeezed out. And so this image we did and presented at the city council meeting. And then here is another, I just have this and one more. This is for um, Environmental Advocates in New York, a collaboration that we did with A2M, the Belgian firm, and LK Policy Lab. They, this office is in an old 1960s grocery store on the corner in Albany, New York, so a cold, colder climate. They wanted their project to be an educational experience, the process of it. Um, here is where they're located, and they raid right downtown from down the street from Albany government buildings, and they were going to have a hub for other advocacy groups to be able to uh, work out of there if they're working with Albany and need a space for the day or two. And it was also a historic district. So we started by taking clear images of the existing building and the 60s building, it was like an architect's design to have steel like breaks in between uh, brick, and which was a really bad thermal bridge there because um, you're just from the street, you're looking at steel and then the windows are very leaky. So we were just analyzing the existing conditions and here we used uh, FLIR, which is a software for modeling to check the conditions. In, this was a roof dominated building. So we needed, even if it was just gonna meet code, it only had one inch of insulation. Just to meet building code would need five or six, but we were proposing even more. Um, and also at the envelope, there was no insulation in this building. Um, that project though did not happen. That was um, just prior to COVID and it was, um, they're still thinking through how they might do this. But this shows you how we how our process is in our office where I learned from the Belgian architecture firm, you, we wanna wrap energy hyper-efficiency into everything that we're doing. And here's um, a project we're really excited about, my final project, which is uh, the Brooklyn Cooperative Federal Credit Union. It's in Bushwick. They have a couple locations they serve um, like five or six zip codes in central Brooklyn. They're opening another branch in Cypress Hills, another area. So it serves like Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, Bushwick, um, Cypress Hills, East uh, Flatbush, I think it's called. And um, so it, it's serving um, members that are members of the credit union. And they also have a nonprofit called Grow Brooklyn which provides free tax services and help from people that are being maybe harassed out of their homes that they've owned for years, or maybe they're having a hard time paying the mortgage, but um, gentrification pressures, it helps give free services to help uh, local families. And so this oblique that a uh, student of mine, former student um, did recently, I, I like this, it's a two-story building it has two front facades. One faces the elevated subway line and the other, this more residential side. We have to have a green roof because of local law 92 and 94. You either need a green roof or solar when you're doing an extreme retrofit. And we're in this case, we're adding one story to the building. And then you see because of a rear yard zoning, we have, to, we have two courtyards that we have inside the enveloped in the building. And then on the corner of this building, aside from the elevated train, you also have um, city bikes right there and a community garden. So we really like the way the building is situated. And um, I wanted to do this drawing to reflect how the building fits in the community. Here's the existing building. It's sort of warehouse-ish. It was a former, the front half that we're looking at is commercial and the back half was a garage and they're occupying it all, but um, but it's it was never fully retrofitted, obviously not energy efficient. Here we've been doing test pits and uh, wall probes. And the craziest thing I said, we always run into issues is that when they did the test pit, we realized there was like a underground tunnel under the slab 
at the back portion because the neighboring multifamily building that went up like undermined or they didn't tell our owner that they were doing the work and they basically built a cellar right next to us and it caused like the soil underneath to move and so we had to have the clients all of a sudden vacate the back portion of the space because it's basically an underground tunnel beneath a slab um, as an existing condition. So that's the type of weird emergencies we end up with. These are just um, two other site photos. And again, I was talking about like special drawings that we do. Uh, Olivia from my office did this drawing to understand where we have existing walls and where we have new walls. We're doing in red new facades that have to meet energy code. On the sides, those are independent walls, but they have to be two hour fire rated and meet energy code. And in some cases they are existing. Um, we have existing foundation walls that are 20 inches. And then at the front half, we have um, three whites of brick, uh, 12 inch at first floor. And then we have to build CMU eight inch on top. <clears throat> in this back portion, there's an open patio area. So that's all gonna be new facade there. And where it's up against this building, it's um, in the back half, we have just two widths of brick for the former garage. And um, we're either gonna save some of it or take it down and, and build CMU with continuous insulation on the outside. And here's just a couple of renderings of those, <coughs> of the um, credit union project that we're excited about. Um, here's the green roof that I was mentioning and um, some views of the interior underway with these courtyards that I think well, they're interested in the well program, which I'm certified in and how you get, how workers feel comfortable back in the work environment. So we're working on keeping um, spaces uh, happy with natural light, access to courtyards, outdoor space and um, hyper efficient. So these are just some images from that project in the center of the building will be a community lounge for different events. And um, here's the courtyard, second floor courtyard on the right and drops down below. On, there's a first year, first floor courtyard too. So that is it. And these are kind of just images of some of our projects fitting into the urban fabric. And uh, my team is the last slide. Uh, Olivia has been working with me a little over four years and Anna's uh, was a student of mine and she's at Princeton grad school but is working for me right now. And so this is our team in my office and um, that is it. <laughs> um, Gabrielle, I'd love to talk to students if they have any questions. Hi hey, Julie, first round of applause. Really <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, I'm going to check the YouTube chat because there are some spam comments in there, but okay. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. It was just super, super inspiring. Um, how you taken on New York and its typical urban fabric just in such an incredible way from the aesthetic parts, the construction, the technical, the legal, it's just super amazing. And yeah, like you made New York City like a laboratory somehow for so, for so much exploration. It's, it's incredible. Um, I have some questions, but I'm sure the students have questions too. Um, I would just like to tell the audience that if you have a question and you're watching on YouTube, you can post in the YouTube chat and then we'll pass that question on to Julie, so I'm watching the YouTube chat. Um, meanwhile, we have also some audience members here in our college. So yeah, while I wait for something to appear in the YouTube, I re resort to the, to the audience members here. Um, questions you have, I'll, I will actually pass you my, my um, phone and that will be your way to to talk to Julie because the mic that I got doesn't want to cooperate with me.
Also, I, I'm just curious if the students imagine themselves opening their own. Uh, Could you repeat that, Julie? I, I was curious if the students imagine themselves opening their own architecture firm. Yeah, I'm curious too. <laughs> Anyone want to help us discuss that? Questions? I'll start with the question, Julie. Um, it has to do with the, the kind of prevailing attitude within architecture culture, at least in the US. And you mentioned it very briefly at one point, which has to do with somehow that renovation or retrofit is not seen as an attractive type of project. It's kind of like a, sub, a subpar project type that, that architects want to eventually graduate from and then take on new big freestanding constructions. Um, how do you, you obviously are, are, are taking a very different position. How do you, yeah, conceptualize or think about that in terms of projects that you can take on do you see that changing at all within the architecture culture or, or do we keep, um, uh, yeah, praising new construction going forward? Um, okay, good question. I, I do think you're right. We always, as architects, we always want to see the new, the new forms. But in New York City, uh, most architects we are dealing with retrofitting is the majority of the work, not, not the larger firms, but smaller firms. And when you look at Ed Masria's uh, architecture 2030, you see that most of the buildings, I think 90% or more of the buildings that will be here in 2040 are already built. So getting those buildings um, retrofitted is a key part of the challenge. I mean, I'm guilty of wanting to do new construction as well. But, but I do realize, and actually giving, preparing for this talk and, and reflecting on, a, I had a new passive house in Seattle that was canceled recently. So reflecting on why do I want new work, I actually enjoy the challenges you see from our drawings where we're figuring out, it's more like surgery, like adding, adding a hip replacement or or a knee replacement. You know, we're we're taking like these pieces left of the building and and building onto it. Um, it's kind of exciting, actually. And the component that's tricky, but also just a reality, is that we're always dealing with neighbors, whether it's a party wall or a independent wall near a property line. As I was describing, like finding like an underground tunnel in the one building and cracks at the other building. There's, there's a lot of cooperation, coordination with neighbors that's stressful, but it's necessary work to like get along in the city. So I feel like maybe that gets political as well, but the more we talk in, to each other and like the better our city is. And so I found that my interest in advocacy and politics like prior to architecture plays a role in just like how I handle myself um, as an architect. And it, it does lead to um, being part of communities that, that need architecture work. So I don't know <laughs> if I answer that right, but I, I think that um, it's probably always going to be the case for some reason that it's uncool to renovate versus new construction, but um, but it's a special skill set and it's kind of amazing um, and helps with embodied energy to to work on existing buildings. That's fantastic. That's brilliant. Very, very interesting to hear your perspective on that. Questions that have come up. Okay. Uh, I'll pass you my phone. Uh, we have. Um, oh, I, I, uh, my phone is basically a mic, so I'll pass you my phone and you can just speak and she'll hear you. So, just one moment, Julie. A question from the audience. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Hold on. Maybe you could, maybe you come here because. Mm -hmm. 
No, Julie. Ah, okay. Maybe you can see me now. Yes. Hi. Okay. We don't know each other. I'm Antonio San Martin. I happen to be visiting professor oh. this couple or three semesters here in Minneapolis. My practice is in Barcelona and in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. So I'm very I'm very happy to hear what you said and congrats for for uh, what you do and um, uh, how you explain it and, and the issues you're dealing with. I think this is this is fantastic. No. Um, uh, uh, there are two or three questions or, or issues that I'm curious about. Sure. Um, I mean, not to compare what, what our practice is in Europe to what is here, that, you know, there are many things that are different, many things that are similar. Of course, uh, for, for, for us in Europe, in Barcelona, anywhere where we work, I mean, demolishing is the last option. It has always been like that. The city has been redone over itself, never by demolition of the previous, no? very rarely. No? So one, one question I have, is there something now in, in the administrative procedures that, um, that prevent from demolishing? Uh, so you, there's some help on the other hand or something, some, some political you know, um, edge to it or, or legislative edge to it is occurring so that demolition is not the first thing to do, which I think is fantastic, but I am not, I'm not aware of it. I, you know, I was my last time, the last time I practiced in the U S I was part of Peter, Peter Eisenman's office. So that was long ago. No? Um, so I wasn't aware of that, of that, of that help, not to the bodies. No? So that's one thing. The other thing is that, uh, uh, I mean, related to the, the I'd like to hear your position on that too, related to the, to whether the students uh, would like to get into their own practice, my my, <laughs> what I get is that the problem is that they have to get a license instead of just getting into practice right after the school. So the problem is that actually school don't provide them with a, you know, a licensed already um, uh, something so they can go. And then they, that's the whole issue. That's why you know in in a, in a, in a country of three, over 300, 300 uh, people. Um, you can name only a few architects because young architects don't get into the game till they get licensed and that may be a decade or a decade and a half farther. So unless there's another way that it gets solved, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for a student to get into the mission because it has to go through this licensing, which is very rare in our own and in the way we see things in Europe. And then the final question is that, um, do, do you think, do you think that what you've explaining the way you have to work, the way we work in Europe and in Switzerland, of course, is all all that's a given. What you've what you've been explaining is a must. So there's no way you can start building a new or an old building if you if if this is not occurring. No? But my question is 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 there any exploration that we've seen occurring in architecture that is now forbidden? For the coming years, do you understand? Oh, say the last part again. I the last part. I'm saying that the fact that the all this is the way we have to practice is this not allowing for experimentations um, in architecture in the way it used to happen before, knowing that we have to just, of course, abide with all these things that we're doing, you know, in our practices. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for that, all those. A, a few, a few different questions. Thank, thank you, thank you, Antonio. All right, yeah, Julie. Thank you, Antonio. I have taken notes, so I can answer those. So, to his first question about demolishing as a last option, I, I do know in my experience um, in New York, it's harder to demolish a whole building. You have to use a different department, best squad. They're called. Um, actually, I think they have a new name now but it's a completely different division at Department of Buildings. So people demolish selectively, which is what I, your poster series spoke to me when you said existing to remain. I always have a lot of existing to remain and selective demolition. If you're demolishing a whole building, that's really for a developer with a lot of money because it's it takes a lot more specificity, you have to use a special team of geotech um, or other specialists to do that 
demolition and if especially if you're doing machined demolition versus handheld machine handheld tools then it um, ups it even further because we've been having this debate at our credit union site like and we're just staying within the simpler demolition type that's handheld equipment so there is i mean to his to antonia's point there is like a bar of entry for demolition and, and it's so most people are not doing the extreme demolition of the entire building unless you're a developer with a lot of means um i i guess that's that's a good thing but there's plenty of those developers so we we do see sites opening up around us um that uh, and i regret it because actually antonio my whole neighborhood was factory buildings like the one i'm in and it got all demolished during 2005 uh bloom mayor bloomberg had a rezoning and it's all condos and none of them were built green except for like maybe one um a lot of them are in lawsuits because of quality of construction and um, they were warehouse buildings um, and ours. Actually, there's one on the corner that was remodeled for a private condo, but otherwise our loft building is one of the only remaining ones in the blocks that I'm at, which is really too bad because they're beautiful masonry buildings that were demolished in favor of uh, less, um, less well-built construction. So the second part to the license I would say in, I'm not sure how it works in Barcelona. I know, I know your program's very rigorous in architecture school. I had a students at Syracuse that were, took a year out of studying in Spain. And I think they always say you fail a year or two. It's like a six year program or something for architecture in Spain. But the license is, um, it does inhibit you, but I still practiced. I, I had a son and I wanted to practice on my own when he was born and I didn't have a license. So I, I practiced as a designer and worked with an architect of record. So that's another way to practice. I also think they've improved it. When I graduated school, I couldn't take the exams until I had three years of apprenticeship finished and then I could sit for my first exam. But students today, they can sit for their first exam right away. So they don't have that same gap. I, I fell into that bracket of women that have a baby, like right at the same time they're supposed to study for their exams. So I didn't get my architecture license till a long time out of school. Like I got it in 2015 and I finished school in 2000. So it took me 15 years, but I still found ways to have my own design firm. So I'll, I'll just mention that. And then the third question about exploration, this is a good question. I wish that in the US, um, I mean, maybe this speaks to architects in Europe, I feel have more of engineering training. And so the level of experimentation with building types, uh, environmental technologies is, um, seems more fruitful in Europe um because we're I don't, we don't necessarily have the technical skill um or a engineering team to work side by side with us kind of inventing as we go but i do think between uh passive house which i think the public expects that uh, architects are building to the best of their capacity and we're not in most cases um in terms of energy efficiency so i think there's a disconnect between what the public thinks we're doing and what we're actually doing. And so you're right, it's a must. I feel like it's a no brainer um, must that we should be doing at a minimum, the energy hyper-efficiency. Um, and uh, we've also seen in the US, I guess, with timber, that that's also another area of experimentation besides Passive House with green. Um, timber construction that's making headways in New York too. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, there's a question on the YouTube. Um, it's actually someone who's in the room, but they, they've typed it into YouTube okay. um, from Jacob Mala. He asks, I was wondering if you could talk about your process in adaptive reuse. How much is it adapting to the conditions you find versus knowing everything right away? 
I think that there's an exploration period. Um, I, I was showing you the last project, which hasn't started construction yet, but we've done the test pits and the um, wall probes and borings. So the getting borings of the soil is one of the first steps. So that we're constantly learning as we go, right? We first survey the building and get to know it and grab any drawings that exist. But then through the test pits and borings, we're learning further. And it does get adapted as you go because you're bidding, at least in New York City, we're bidding it out to multiple contractors and they all have different expertise and opinions. Um, we do, our drawings do, we have to follow fire rating and energy code as a guide, but there might be a, a new approach that a builder comes to the table. And in our case, we have an architect as an owner's rep. So it's always a dialogue and conversation with uh, the whole team all the way until construction's even happening where we may need an amended filing. So I think it's it's a constant conversation on how to adapt and reuse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question from the YouTube audience, John Green asks, do you ever encounter projects where preservation and rehabilitation with their associated standards and requirements, adding to cost, complexity, et cetera, become forces for exclusion and inequity in communities where that is happening? Um, that's a great question. So I, I'm gonna interpret that in two different ways. One is cost, construction cost is so high um, right now. I don't know if it is everywhere or in Minnesota, but for example, we just lost a project we've been working on for years in Seattle because the construction cost has gone up a square foot. Um, it's doubled or tripled in the last three years just because of the supply chain and issues with COVID. So that's, that's one thing where whether you're doing passive house envelope or not, that we just the cost of regular construction. Then there's the next layer of that, which is in New York City, someone's paid a ton for a lot of money for real estate they're not really in the mood to spend a lot on renovating. Um, and that's, you know, I'm not trying to get them to spend money. I'm just trying to get them a good envelope and what they want. Uh, so I will say that there, you're always coming up against pressures to not do the hyper-efficiency that you want to. I mean, that I wish contractors were more on the same page with me in their goal, but most of them are, you know, they're bidding, they don't, they don't wanna go bankrupt. They, they wanna like make their money and move on. So it is hard. I do, and I don't like feeling like a salesperson for something, you know, like I'm just trying to get the building done right. So I will say that I'm very good at getting, showing the clients the value of the triple glazed windows and doors and the envelope. You always have time later to do the interior again, like if you need to put in a kitchen that's not your dream kitchen, but you could replace later. But the building infrastructure, like the, the shell needs to be done right <coughs> the first time. And I feel like the clients are getting that. And they're also coming with goals of wanting to cut fossil fuel from coming into the home and wanting to have alternate energy. In terms of ways of, who gets left out? And this is a great question that I grapple with all the time as I showed you my own like freezing room and I'm, I'm like someone of middle income means. Um, I don't think we can do this right until everyone, any renter can live, have the right to live in this way um, with, you know, wellness at the interior, fresh air and a energy efficient envelope. Um, there is, there are different programs. I'm actually exploring ways to maybe do multiple things in my office. Cause I, if it takes me three years to do, um, a retrofit of a building like that, that's, I don't have that much time left to like help, help the way I want to. And there's a program, for example, at the Pratt center 
um, where I had the Taconic Fellowship, where it's taking 75 the low income homeowners in, from Brooklyn and, and it's a retrofit, energy retrofit program. That type of program on, you know, from multiple agencies and in um, different ways is how we get there. Like that would feel really good as a career move for me if I could all of a sudden be working on 75 projects at the same time. I obviously it wouldn't be the same type of hands-on work, but I do think that that's where urban planning and policy and like you see that we have such a massive task in front of us that um, we can, yeah, I think it's important for architects to consider maybe going in and out of working on smaller project and then doing larger scale and then back because there, there's so much to be done. Thank you. That was a yeah fantastic response. I, something that I was wondering about too, because yeah, so much time and money and investment of different kinds goes into one project. But then if you think the city is millions of buildings, so how do you ever get towards that? And I think what you described um, starts to respond to that. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up, but has been really great so far. Um, this is from also... A question in the YouTube audience from Gabriel uh, Mendes. Have you worked on building on the NHRP? And how did you, how did or do you approach the process in retrofitting? Uh, I guess the National Historic Register. Oh, yeah. I have not. Oh, oh, I should say with landmarks though, because I was, I mentioned to you that I was teaching a class uh, to architects and engineers. So I, I was doing research and when I, at the time for landmarks of um, the brownstone that I showed in Fort Greene, I had to actually present to the community board and to a landmarks commission to get permission to put in triple glaze, double, hung, double simulated hung windows. And I look forward to that kind of process. I've worked with all different kinds of agencies. I got no pushback. I mean, sometimes there's always someone <coughs> who gives you a hard time. They were all very supportive of this. And I spoke to the head of um, Landmarks at the time. They had gone through at least 38 projects. I'm not saying those were all passive house, but maybe they used passive house windows uh, on their project. <coughs> and they, um, they decided, I think it was one or two years ago, that it would therefore be a decision by the reviewer at the desk rather than having to go through community board and um, like a commission presentation. So they made it easier. So I can speak to that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julie. That was. <laughs> and there, one yeah. more thing, Gabriel, okay. there is. Um, building science to it. So you don't want to over insulate a landmark building. Use less insulation because <laughs> you're otherwise your facade is colder than it's ever been. Like right now it's being heated by the radiator a little bit. So you don't want to then block out the facade from any of the indoor heat. So it's it's a matter of using less insulation and studying to make sure that you're not creating a like a building science condition that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been amazing to hear how you connect something that might seem so banal as wall detail to polit political expression as you described in the beginning. And yeah, the way that you can integrate so many layers of thinking from the political, social, technical aesthetic is really, really inspiring. So thank you again so much, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. I have to say with, um, with COVID and isolation, like a lot of my staff, it was like we're not together anymore, that um, I appreciate being invited to talk. I feel like it's hard as a small practice sometimes to, to be heard or even take the time to like reflect. And so I appreciate the opportunity to talk because it allowed me to reflect on what I'm doing and where I want to go. Um, Wonderful. Happy to hear that. Thank you.
Thank you again. Thank you again. And thanks to the audience. Check in with the rest of the series too. It looks like good speakers. Yeah. <laughs> One more. One more Thank you.